Uh, well, I, I got somebody that I don't really need to think much about when it comes to his expertise on the Detroit Lions, and that's Mr. Yeah. Jeremy Reisman. He'll be joining the program Not out. here right now. Welcome, Jeremy. Let's go. Uh, Not out. Man, we, man, that was a professional segue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got hey for you, Jeremy. We're, I'm trying to cook here. Jeremy Reisman, you guys know him, of course. If you're a Lions fan, you follow them. Uh, Proud of Detroit Zone. He's a, a beat writer for them, and he does great work. And Jeremy, uh, I want to ask you to start off here, and we'll just get right into. It. I know I, I private message private message you about it as well. Can you just get because I read your article? It's great. I think you, yeah. you put it very well. Uh, the Legarius Sneed stuff that because yeah. I, I went back and forth with Lions fans yesterday about it, and there's a there's a big part of Lions fans that believe. You know, they, they need a corner. I understand. But then there's a part of me, which I tried to make the argument, that it, that does not scream Brad Holmes, Jeremy, at no. all. I mean, the guy has, has really telegraphed everything he's done since he's been here. And all he's all he's been saying all offseason is like, we're not trying to win headlines in March. We're trying to win in December. And I joked about this on my podcast. But someone needs to, like, pull him aside and be like, no, we're trying to win in January, not just December. <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, ev everything this team has done in the past um, it ha has not been going after that top tier guy. Now, if Legereus Sneed was just a plain free agent, maybe there's a shot the Lions at least give a call and see what he's looking for. But now that he's also going to probably be behind the franchise tag, which means you're going to have to trade for him right. on top of giving a big deal. Like now we're talking about big cap, big draft capital, big free agency capital. It's just not the kind of move that the Lions have made. And I think there, there's a lot of reasons for it. One is that you don't want to necessarily give yourself up to a long and big commitment to a guy you don't know. That's another thing that Dan and Brad have talked about. It's like the reason why we don't go wild in free agencies because we don't know those guys. We don't know if they fit our culture. We don't know if they fit our scheme. Um, we're much more comfortable with the, the draft and development. And I don't know, like I would get throwing some money at a free agent corner. I think they're going to do that in some fashion, probably not one of those top tier guys, but a significant investment. investment but once you start taking draft picks away from Brad Holmes, you're doing this team a disservice. The guy can draft. That's how you build the team. That's how you get a position of need at a young at a young player at a, at a low price. So I'm kind of all out on Legere's need. As soon as I heard the Chiefs were going to potentially franchise tag him and, and facilitate a trade, make it sound like it's a, oh, wow, they're doing all these teams a favor. They're facilitating a trade. No, you're <laughs> you're making him cost more. And, and, and for that reason, I'm out. Yeah, Legere Sneed, by the way, former fourth round pick. All right, right. So let's, let's relax. You can get that guy in the draft. Yeah. Let's go. Brad Holmes could find a guy like him. I'm, I agree with you too on that, Jeremy. I think that I'm, I'm kind of out on that as well. I do want to ask you this though. This is I feel like a headline this off season, obviously. Um, and, and some stuff came out today about the Amon Ross St. Brown extension. Mm -hmm. Um, and then obviously Jared Goff extensions and those, those conversations, and then Panay Sewell. Um, we we spoke with a couple of different people, and they they kind of were on both sides of the Jared Goff thing of him is if he's going to get extended. Where yeah. where are you at on that? And I know you're in the building, so you you may hear some stuff about it. Do you think all three of these guys get extended, um, this off season? It's, it's a good question. Um, I, I think, obviously, it sounds like Amon Ra is priority number one right now, and that makes sense. I mean, the guy's been underpaid like crazy for the first three years in his career. Um, I was just looking at his contract right now, and, you know, his his signing bonus as a fourth-round pick was less than a million. He's never made a million in salary yet in his career, so I, I think both sides are probably eager to pay that guy what he's actually worth. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that doesn't surprise me at all. I think Jared Goff is probably next on the list. I do think a deal probably gets done here um, just because the, I get, the team has supported him from the get-go. He, he brought the team to where they haven't been in 30 years, and he's really been a very steady force for them. There's really only been a handful of games really since they turned it around halfway through that first season that he's struggled. Um, the, the, the issue then becomes, and, and a lot of people don't think about this because they just think about the, you know, the finances in terms of salary cap, but this also requires a very big cash investment to make three big extensions in off, one off season. You know, when you're talking about a signing bonus, all that money is, is paid to the player right away. So if you're do if you're paying Amon Ra, if you're paying Jared Goff and you're paying Panay Sewell all in one off season, that requires a huge amount of cash up front from the Ford family. and and I, I don't know if she, you know Sheila has that money right right away or if she has to put some in escrow or, or whatever, but um, that's just kind of another thing to think about because the Lions haven't been in this kind of position where they're handing out three ginormous uh, extensions in one offseason. So I, yep. I think with Panay, it would make most sense. You got the fifth-year option to probably wait a year. You can spread out the cap hits uh, 
respectively. So it's not all hitting at the same time for all three of those guys. Um, so if I had to guess, I would probably guess those first two get the, an extension done while you, you kind of kick the can just a year down the road for Panay. That one's going to get done for sure as well. And, and he's probably, he might get paid. I, I was going to say more than all three, but obviously the quarterback gets the most, but Panay is going to get the Brinks yeah. truck in, in his backyard. No, no doubt. And I'm, I'm in locks up with you there, Jeremy. My question is outside of the Detroit Lions, Brad, we just talked about the money that they have. Where do you think position wise corner defensive end offensive line outside of the Detroit Lions, Where do you think they make that first signing? And if who, who would it be as well? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, it has to be, you, you have to sign a corner. You have to sign probably a guard. It, it depends if you re-sign Jonah there, but, um, you, you try to fill as many needs in free agency as you can. And, and that's what Brad Holmes has, has said in the past. That's what I always say too, is like you want to go into the draft and we know Brad Holmes loves going into the draft where there is not a position in which you have to draft. You have to get a guy. This team is good enough where they shouldn't be relying on that many rookies to start anymore. As good as Brad Holmes is at drafting, like we cannot expect what happened last year to happen again. There should, mm -hmm. this team is too good to have four starters. Even if you have four, four picks again in the top 100, which they do, they're not going to have four guys that are starting and contributing at the level that they did last year. And so um, I, th I think they kind of hit free agency in, in terms of their needs hard. And, and that means probably signing two or three corners, honestly, uh, and, and a guard if, if, if they don't re-sign Jonah. And even if they do re-sign Jonah, there, there's going to be some depth that they need on that offensive line. They probably need a, a, a third tackle because Matt Nelson uh, and, and Dan Skipper are both free agents. They might bring one or two of those guys back. Yeah. Yeah, big old skip. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. Like, when, when you look at some of the, the free agent corners, I'm kind of of the belief that I think this team should maybe go veteran there. Um, oh, it'd be nice to get one of these young guys and sign them to those four-year, $80 million deal. Um, but I kind of like the patchwork idea combined with drafting one. So you get one of those guys that are 30, 32, pick whichever one you want. You know, um, you, you want to... Re reunite the Gilmores. I'm I'm down with that. Yeah, perfect, um, perfect. Yeah, Jeremy, you're speaking our language right now. Exactly. Man. Yeah, that's <laughs> what we've been preaching over here. And then, but then, then you make sure you follow that up with a draft too, so that you have like a Gilmore there to help hit, bring him along. You have two veteran corners on your outside for a year or two, and then you hopefully have your your future up there in the beginning. Because it, it wasn't that long ago before you know the Sauce Gardeners threw the narrative out the window, where we were saying it takes two or three years for young corners to develop in this league and i still think that's mainly the case but now you know sauce Gardner comes along um even even witherspoon last year yeah, yeah. uh it kind of throws it throws people off and, and thinks that that's the norm that's not really the norm and especially when you're picking at 28 29 whatever it is um i think the lines would would be wise to maybe sit a, a young corner on the bench for a year uh if, if they can afford to and, and play a couple veterans at corner and those for uh, for who are just tuning in, we're joined by Jeremy Reisman again from Pride of Detroit. You can check them out, prideofdetroit.com. And Jeremy, uh, I know I know trying to crack the Brad Holmes safe for the draft is like it's like trying to crack a safe that just won't open. It's all it's yeah. nearly impossible. But I'll ask you in in your uh, opinion at pick twenty nine. Yeah. What, what's the what, what would be the move there ideally for you? Is it is it you think Brad would trade back, trade up? Because I see it, the talk of Darius Robinson. I mean, he's been one of the most intriguing <laughs> players lately, and Lions fans yeah. seem to love him. I know Russ, uh, Russell Brown, and Scott Bischoff. They mentioned uh, a possible offensive lineman at twenty nine. What, sure. what way do you think Brad will go? What's your gut telling you? Man, it, my, my gut is always telling me he's just going to pick the guy he loves the most. And if yeah. if there's there's one of those guys that's at twenty five and he just can't wait, he's going to go up and get him. Or if none of those guys are there at 29, he'll drop back. It, I know this isn't a very uh, definitive answer for you, but that's I, I've kind of learned to stop trying to predict it, what he's going to do, because right. it, it really is. It's really about identifying the guys that really fit what they are. And I think that's why everyone is talking about Darius Robinson is because everything he said, everything he's done, uh, even, you know, his play style, I think, fits what the Lions want to do. I think the, the stuff, the thing that's becoming really hard for me right now to fig is figuring out exactly what they want on that defensive line. Because, you know, I heard you guys talking uh, about chop and, and I'm, I'm very intrigued by a guy like chop, but I'm also, in I'm also wondering if he fits what they want, because you look, it, it, they're, they're kind of looking for two different kinds of edges, right? You have your James Houston's, you can even throw Matthew Betts in there. The CFL guy, kind of the same, type of like, yeah, it, they kind of fall into that same bucket as, as, as chop Robinson, like yep. these smaller size, elite potential pass rushers 
but you kind of you're concerned about one their ability to maybe drop in coverage because they like to use that position to drop in coverage and then can they be a three down player that's why james houston hasn't gotten the playing time that every fan wants him to do they can't trust him to be a three down player but then you have like these big tall massive long-armed guys like darius robinson and well, you already have Josh Pascal. You already have John Kaminsky, two guys that are very much like it. We know they love the, like those kind of guys. All all are the all offer kind of the same thing where it's like you're you're great at setting the edge on on, on when you're playing defensive end, but you can also slide inside and, and give a little pass rush. And I think that's where Darius Robinson kind of separates him from Kaminsky uh and Josh Pascal is I think he gives a little bit more pass rush, but at the same time, we've seen so many Lions players break out in year three under this regime. Don't you want to give Josh Pascal that chance? And so I, I'm really going back and forth if we're talking defensive line and what they're potentially looking for, because I think they have some answers already that they're waiting to develop, but also they're so different in what they want in certain positions. I don't know which one they they're, they're going to be preferring when, when they're on the clock there at 29, if, it, if at all. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. I'm hoping that they, kind of revamped his defensive line a little bit. That's been my, kind of my conversation this offseason doing that. I do want to – other side of the ball, though, real quick, Jeremy, um, yeah. kind of the weapons on offense. We know, like, J-Mo's kind of getting into that year, and Dan actually talked about him uh, becoming that, like, full-time starter. And the same with um, Josh Reynolds being a free agent now. Do you see them at all – and I know you said you're, you're not sure really what they'll do at 29. It's hard to see what Brad does. Do sure. you think they add another weapon to this offense or just say, hey, let's roll with J-Mo, Josh Reynolds – I'm in Rod kind of roll with what we have already or go get a Keon Coleman or a, a vet free agent add to this team. Where, where do you kind of see them going that direction? I, I certainly don't think they're going to shy against it. If the opportunity arises, I, I do think that they probably resign Josh Reynolds. They, they love the guy and, and they should, he does everything they want to be everything they want to do. He can play really any of the receiver positions and, and they praise him. They praised him all season for his ability to just, seamlessly slide in if someone gets injured um if you know if, if if someone is sick whatever like he'll go in and he'll play that position and and they won't think twice about it. he's a very smart cerebral player and a hard worker so i think they bring him back but that doesn't really re remember when you're drafting you're drafting for two three years down the line so who knows where josh reynolds is going to be in two years who knows where jmo is going to be in two years if they find a guy that that's their dude if it is like if keon coleman is there like i'm very much of the belief he's in play at 29 um, yep. regardless of, of who else is on the board, because yeah, I think, I think you have to play the draft two or three years down the line. And for as good as maybe the wide receiver position looks in 2024, it's going to look different in 2025. It's going to look different in 2026. So that's what you're drafting for. And so I think wide receiver is absolutely on the table for 29. If the right guy is there. Yeah. And just talking about the draft, I just want to move back to free agency for a second. So the cap just went up, I believe a little over $30 million dollars. And a yep. huge part of this free agency for the Detroit Lions is what they do with Jonah Jackson. So in your opinion, do you think that boost in salary cap space will it increases the likelihood to re-sign Jonah? And if they do, do you support it? Just because I have a little pushback just because of his injury history with the amount that he's going to command from the salary cap. Yeah, I think I think it maybe increases his chances a little bit. Um, it was interesting when, when Brad Holmes joined, I think, 97-1 earlier this week on Monday. He was asked about the salary cap increase and, and how that impacts – you know, maybe how they maneuver. And he actually said it, it probably doesn't impact you internally all that much because you already kind of earmark that money in the off season. You already kind of plan for what you wanted to do internally ahead of time. And so maybe that makes me think that this doesn't change things that mm -hmm. much, but um, he did note like, but externally, like maybe this means one guy that you thought was out of reach is now kind of in the conversation and maybe one extra signing you, you can make. Um, but with Jonah, it's really tough. I, I'm very curious as to what his agency is is pushing for because the injuries have obviously been a problem. He, even when he was healthy this year, it wasn't his best season. But I still believe he's very much a culture fit. I, I think he's a, a scheme fit. I mean, he is a, a mauler in the run game. I thought he struggled in pass protection this year. But in general, I think he's a very good run, defend, or run blocker. And obviously, that's kind of what they base their entire offense on. So... If, I mean, if, if they could bring him back for like a 10 to 12 million a year type of deal, maybe three years, 30 million, three years, 33 million, something like that. I, I think you probably still try to get it done because the, the one thing, again, Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell have said all offseason is like, we are not going to ignore the offensive line position. We know that is how we made our bread and butter last year. We know it's the engine under the hood. Um, we can't let that slide. We, we, we got to make sure, even though we want to improve everywhere else, 
we can't take a step back in a, in a position so critical as offensive line. And, you know, even if they were drafting one, that that's a pretty big risk to start a rookie. I don't mm-hmm. think a guy like Colby Sorzel is necessarily going to be ready in 2024. And, and as they've said, like, you never know if an external off, uh, free agent is, is going to fit what you want to do. So I'm still kind of of the belief that they should at least attempt to bring back Jonah Jackson. But if we're, if we're starting to talk 14, 15 million a year, that's when I think you got to start looking at plan B's. Hey, real Great quick, Jeff, Jeff, just real no. quick, I got to follow yeah. up on that. It is, yeah. And I, I was thinking about this today. It is I'm listening to like different Jared Goff stuff earlier today. Do you think there's a and, and I know you already mentioned the Jared Goff contract. Do you think there's a scenario where Jared's like speaking with Jonah Jackson and um, Graham and is like, hey, like maybe I'll take a little bit less. And I know this is a why it might be a conspiracy, but like, yeah, he, he works with these guys hand in hand all year. Like he gets close with them. Is there sure. a thing where he's like, instead of 45, hey, I'll take 41 or 42. I'll make sure, but are you guys going to come back if I do that? And they kind of have a little discussion in house. I, I thought of that today. And, yeah. And I haven't heard anyone talk about it and it popped up in my head. And I'm like, I wonder if that's been a conversation um, in that room there. It's, it's, it's an interesting thought. And, and you have to imagine the guys talk about money every now and then, right? Like, I'm sure it's impossible yeah. for them not to. Um, but in general, I kind of think like the hometown discount thing, I think that's generally something that's a little bit more fan generated than, than in reality, you know, everyone always brings up Brady and, and yep. I, I feel like, again, that's more the exception than, than the norm. Yes. Um, and with um, Jonah, you remember he's coming off his rookie deal too. So he's going to, he's going to want to get paid. Um, will, will Jared Goff, you know, I don't know how many Detroit Red Wings chance of, of Jared Goff it takes for him to, <laughs> to take a hometown discount, but, uh, the Lions fans are sure trying. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. It, I, I I wouldn't discount it a hundred percent, but in general, I think players are going to want to get paid and, you know, this could be Jared Goff's last big p- contract as well, or they could, you know, make it a little bit of a shorter term deal. So that maybe he has one more opportunity to, to cash in before uh, his play decreases. So, I mean, it, it's always possible, but in general, I, I tend to think that sort of stuff is, is wishful thinking. And, and man, I wish it too. Like it, even, if, even if Goff were to accept a 45 million a year deal, I think that would be very, quote unquote team friendly so um hopefully hopefully that's the number we're looking at but i honestly wouldn't be surprised to see it closer or even surpass 50 million a year yeah and i'll go around every event in detroit and start chanting jared golf (laughs) keep doing it i'll do what i need to do for the people drink all the kool-aid in the world to make it (laughs) oh yeah honestly i will uh great stuff jeremy we appreciate you for taking the time to join the program you guys can find jeremy on x at detroit online check out the guys over at pride detroit they crush their crush man they're doing great work great uh jeremy i do want to ask you uh, do you find you, your keys get back? You get your keys? We'll see. We'll see. All it's, right. it's, it's been a month and a half long saga from the San Francisco Jeez. airport. We'll see. Right. What happened? I, I left my keys in San Francisco when I was there for the NFC championship game. And I have a little tracker on it. And it was there for like four weeks straight. Didn't move. And then it went to a UPS or yeah, no FedEx in right outside of the airport. Now it's in Texas at another FedEx right by oh there, that airport. And <laughs> like there's there's a way that you can like scan the QR code on on the little tracker that gives you like my contact information. So fingers crossed that someone saw it, found it, and and have now sent it my way. <laughs> yeah, there's a hey, chance that'd be, that'd be something. The odds on that are insane. I know. <laughs> That's it's a fun little um, saga to follow. Though. Yeah, uh, we'll stay in touch, Jeremy. I appreciate you, man, for taking the time. Appreciate it, Jeremy. Thanks, fellas. I appreciate you, Jeremy. And there you go, Jeremy Reisman. Uh, yeah, he. I mean, again, answer a lot of the questions I had.